be sure you understand the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. Not only should you confess them, but you should stop them. I mean, the reason of confession is bringing you to awareness. You have a problem with it. Correct it. Don't keep going back to the sin and then back to the well of forgiveness. I mean, just correct it. No reason to do that. Whatever you think you're gaining by it, you're not. Just correct it in your life. Correct that area of your life by the word of God and walk in the spirit instead of the flesh. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of James 4, 13 through 17 to our life that we might realize we live one day at a time. Our promises in that day and for tomorrow are all connected with God as a believer. And we need to understand that and stop worrying about things we shouldn't be worrying about. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 6. We worry about things. We worry about stuff rather than life. We worry about stuff, ornamentals of life, the ornaments of life, like the ornaments of a tree, the Christmas tree. And so, Father, I pray that you'd clear up some issues in our life tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. What I want to do, I want you to see the three parts to this passage of study. Once I show them to you, you'll be able to see them with clarity. Verse 13 and 14 is one section. Verse 15 and 16 is a second section. And the 17 is a third section. Look down in verse 17. See the word therefore. He's making a conclusion. Therefore, you know, you say, you know, why, why for is therefore. And that's a conclusion, verse 17. So verse 13 and 14 go together because he's talking about, come now you who say, and that's a false way of thinking. It's, he's introducing a false way for Christians to think about life in verse 13 and 14. Notice verse 15 and 16, he comes back and said, instead, you ought to say, In verse 15, he says, instead, you ought to say, in other words, don't buy into verse 13 and 14, as many Christians were doing, but buy into verses 15 and 16, and then he draws a conclusion from verse 17. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting in verse 13, when he says, come now, actually, it's the word ago. It means to, to go. And notice I wrote down on your paper, it's a present active imperative, second person plural, and it's used like slang. It would be, it would be something like, come on. Come on. Have you ever heard people say that? Come on. Or go to... You know where? You ever heard people say that? Well, go to. This is the word for that. This is the concept. The word, come on. I mean, so what this, what, this is a slang term, uh, uh, a street kind of concept of this word, uh, a, a street kind of concept of this word to show displeasure and disgust right come on or go to you know where so that's the, that's how he introduces this subject <laughs> uh, james gives in verses 13 and 14 what we call a cosmos diabolical or worldly view of life the christians shouldn't be living it the world lives it, and the world talks about it and promotes it. 
but that's not what believers should be about. Now, watch what he says in verse 13 and 14. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make money or profit. The problem, he says in verse 14, the problem with that idea for Christians. He said that's a worldly view of doing business. But what they miss in that view, he brings out in verse 14. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. That's a common sense approach. <laughs> You're making all these plans for the future and you don't have any idea how to get there. You have a plan, but <laughs> today is what day? Wednesday. It's Wednesday. <laughs> now you can have plans for tomorrow. And that's okay. You can have plans tomorrow. Well, what are you going to do if those plans don't come to pass? You got, all your, you got all your money riding on that dog, and that dog dies. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because I tell you, you don't control tomorrow. The only way you know there is a tomorrow is God told you there's Thursday. You know, tomorrow is, a, is another day. And you didn't design the day. God made the day. We call it by what he named it. We call it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> we call it day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. So your tomorrows have all been, already been created and planned for you. You have no idea. You say, well, I'm going to go. This is what I'm going to do. Here is my plan for the whole next year. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't even know if you're going to have a tomorrow. You don't even know that. The only person that knows that with certainty is God Almighty. Even the world doesn't know if they have a tomorrow because Jesus Christ could come today and the church would be gone. There would be no tomorrow for the church. And that which is left is now in a timetable countdown, right? So the writer says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You, your life, is just a vapor. The Greek word I put on your paper because it's where you get the word atmosphere. A-T-M-I-S, atmos, atmosphere. It is the concept of vapor. It's a concept of what comes from your breath. You know how on a cold day, have you ever gone on a cold day and, and breathed out? And you can see it, can't you? The first time you can see your breath is on a cold day. You see your breath. You go like, wow, that's pretty interesting. The only other time you could do it is if, if you do the vapor cigarette type of thing. Then you. <laughs> I saw a guy puff on his cigarette, that vapor deal. I saw him do that the other day. He blew it out. You couldn't even see him. <laughs> and I went... I'm glad they didn't have an eye in there because two of us went in and smoked a room right out. <laughs> you, you'd have been pulling. You know, there's no way you could have got out of that room. I went, geez. Well, anyhow. He says you're like a vapor, the word vapor. Your life is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know what that is? That's the hyphen on a tombstone. You know where the hyphen is on a tombstone? Yeah. Between birth and death. That's your whole life. <laughs> I don't know what your people thought of you, but that's what they gave you. 
your entire life is a hyphen. Boy, you better do something with that life because there is life after death. And that hyphen, it plays an enormous role on your next life. Huh? Not only that are you going to heaven, but the things you're going to receive in heaven by rewards and, and honors and decorations and crowns, it's going to be phenomenal. And they're all... It's just a dash. <laughs> a dash. Just between our birth, that's yeah. it. It's just a dash. That's it. Just go out there. And that's kind of what he's saying here. You, your life is just a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. If you've ever done that, whew, northern kids know what I'm talking about. I don't know if you get enough cold weather to do it in the south, but I do you? Well, good for you. Good for you. We used to, as little kids, we used to think we could actually freeze it. So we'd all get together and we would chain breathe. We thought if we could keep it out there long enough, it'd probably freeze. And we used to have a chain and that we'd go down the chain. You've started. We tried to keep that out there as long as we could, and we never could freeze it. You could do it with water. You could throw it up, and it'd vapor and come free, freeze, but you couldn't do it with That's how we entertained ourselves in the north. That and putting our tongue on something cold. Yeah, you only do that once. So there's 13 and 14. He said, this is why, come on now, you who say today and tomorrow you shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there to engage in business and profit. Stop and think about that a moment, he says in verse 14. If you think all of that's what your life's about, you've missed the whole purpose in your life as a believer. It's not about that. Your life is not about what you do nor the things you accumulate apart from the will of God. So in verse 15, he says, instead, you ought to say, this is the counterpunch, if the Lord wills. See, it's, all, it's not about your plans and your will. It's about his plans and his will. This is what's going to make your life successful in time and eternity. He said, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, and then he gives us the positive here, we shall live and also do this or do that. This and that is determined by the will of God. How about that? I mean, how important would that be in your business? I mean, you go on cold calls. Wouldn't it be good to be able to hit them 100%? Wouldn't that be good? Well, you know how you do it? You turn it over to the Lord. He'll put you in the right places. I mean, have you ever thought of that? I mean, have you not thought going to this place and that place to do business? Have you never thought? Should you not say if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that? See, this is the this and that. That's what the, he called it the this and that which we live out should be according to the will of God. We're not going to call it out. We're going to leave the Lord to call out what we're doing in this and that day. This and that is during the day, right? We're doing this and I'm doing that. What are you doing now? Well, I'm doing a little bit of this and that. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, all that little this and that, which makes up what we're doing in that day, ought to be according to the Lord's will. He ought to be engaged in it. He wants to be engaged in it. He wants to be engaged in it. He wants, you to be, he wants you to be productive, but he wants you to do it his way. His way. You say, I don't think it worked. Listen, I sold insurance with Jane's father. He was a very successful insurance man, plus other businesses he had. And we live by this principle. You can't, you couldn't live in the business, in the, in the insurance business without cold calls. I don't suppose you can do it in any, any business where you're uh, on commission. You got to get out there and hustle. It's not a matter of hustle. It, that's just this and that. See, th this and that needs to be controlled by if, if it's the Lord's will. 
So I've done those cold calls. I've done it the world's way, and I've done it the Lord's way. And I'll tell you, the Lord's way is the better way. I'm going to tell you, it's a better way. I can tell you that. Then verse 16, watch what he says. He says, but as it is, watch this now, because verse 15 is what we ought to be doing. Verse 13 and 14 is the wrong. And so he tries to correct it because he says, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance. That's verse 13 and 14. You boast in your arrogance. That, that's the, the word in the Greek language, the word for pride and vain glory. I mean, you do it your way because you want to promote self. Listen, you do it God's way, you have to promote him. The glory goes to him. It doesn't go to you. Yeah, but my boss is not going to understand that. Well, he understands the bottom line. <laughs> it's always about the bottom line, isn't it, guys? Gals? Bottom line. All such, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance or pride. All such boasting, watch this, is evil. Notice I wrote down in your paper, evil. The word evil, it's poneros. There are different words in the Greek language for evil. When you have poneros, I give you a great verse for every time you find evil. Now, you'd have to have a Greek text to know because in the English it just says evil. But it could be it could be kakaya, uh, it could be kakaya, evil or chaos. I don't know. My tongue is not working in the Greek language tonight. It could be e evil, and it, it is going to be mentioned here, or or it could be pateros, as it is mentioned here. The evil that's mentioned here is Poneros, and it goes to first, first John, a great verse for that, Poneros evil, is First John 5, 19, where the devil is referred to as the evil one. In other words, he, this is what he promotes. He promotes Poneros evil. That's why we call that, listen, we call Poneros, in theology, we call it cosmos diabolicus. Cosmos is the world, diabolicus is the devil, it's the devil's system of ways of thinking and behaving. So 1 John, I give you 1 John 1, 9, uh, 5, 19 is a, is a key verse for this idea of Poneros referring to Cosmos Diabolicus. And one of the verses I like, and I wrote it down for you because I like it, is 2 Corinthians 2, 11, which says, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices or schemes. It's really important, and this is what James is trying to point out here. It may, it may seem really innocent about doing your plans and planning this and planning that out in the future. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that unless it's exclusive of God. If all that planning is not based on the Word of God and divine viewpoint thinking, then your life is going to be, ex your expectations of life are always going to be disappointing. And that's why he used a slang word to start with. Come on now. You know better than that. Come on now. You know better than that. Because there's a lot of things held in tomorrow that you don't have any clue of, but God does. You understand? Right? You was on your way picking up some people to come to church. Who would have ever guessed that yesterday that tomorrow you would have an automobile accident? I mean, who would know that but God himself? But God knew that. He knows as much about, listen, I know you know that. Why, why would I spend any more time telling you God knows all about tomorrow as much as he did yesterday? Listen, listen. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. <laughs> the consistency in your life needs to be the Lord's will. The consistency, 
the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever is the Lord. Well, why is that hard to understand? Okay. And so, he, what he mentions is three problems. Notice I identify them. He says, first of all, you've forgotten that your life is a vapor. He said, secondly, you, you, you don't understand your life can vanish. Boom. I saw that email from Sherry Butler on her friend Terry, whose husband died in sleep. Well, that was a great transition from sleep to sleep. <laughs> we all wish for that one, couldn't we? I guess, I don't know. Guys like Horton want to die with their boots on, with a sword in their hand. You know, I was thinking after I got that email from Sherry, like you did, I suppose everybody in the room got that, right? Sure. When I was a little bitty kid, a baby, I don't know if I was ever a little bitty kid, but when I was a little baby, I mean really young, one or two years of age, uh, my grandmother every night would tuck me in. I slept upstairs in the farmhouse, which I didn't know was kind of, are you kidding me? You got this one-year-old kid upstairs in the farmhouse and everybody else slept downstairs? I never really thought anything about it. That was just the way we lived as farmers. She's, but I, and, and when I began to go to school, my grandmother stopped doing this for some reason, I don't know why. And I haven't thought about this in a long time, but I remembered that prayer. Yeah, and I wrote it down. I remembered it just as clear as when my grandmother, we would get down and kneel on the side of her bed. And I don't remember my family ever being religious in the sense of religious. I mean, we weren't churchgoers and all that. Uh, like most people are in the South, you know, maybe Christmas and Easter and once I mean, we, we farmed. You know, not a lot of people, did, but we, we didn't. But. And I remember that prayer, and so I wrote it down. Now I lay me down to sleep. I mean, I've probably many of you prayed that prayer. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But if I should die before I wake, my grandmother used to say, I thank the Lord my soul he keeps. And I hadn't thought about that in a 100 years. I'm close to it. <laughs> I used to say that as a joke. <laughs> now it's reality. Uh, what a great little prayer that was, the way she prayed it. I think maybe people prayed that last part a little different than my grandmother did. But she prayed, I thank the Lord. And I can remember that as a little bitty kid. I mean, I know she stopped. we stopped doing that after I started kindergarten or first grade or whatever it was. Hmm. Well, I just happened to think about it and wrote it down, so I just shared it with you. Because that is true, isn't it? I mean, he has our tomorrow, and he has it well planned out. Just follow his plan. It's okay to have your plans. Make sure that they adjust to his, right? Always make sure they adjust to his. And he teaches that all the time because you got these plans and he always adjusts it. You know, Rick will get on an airplane and they'll say, uh, sorry, we're not going to take off today. We're going to take off tomorrow <laughs> or some crazy thing, you know, or all of a sudden they're, they're in the air and they go like, well, we're going to make an emergency stop. You know, thank, thank God. And, uh, and the list goes on, you know. And you got to really be able to adjust to that moment and go like, okay, who in this plane needs, <laughs> let me have the phone a moment. <laughs> Let's talk about if the plane don't get down in good shape. Are we ready to meet our maker kind of deal? Give me the phone. 
See, I'm thinking that's a Horton on the airplane. Give me that phone. Well, anyhow, let's talk about point one. Oh, verse 17 says, therefore, the one who knows, that's oida, it's in the perfect tense. That's information solidly put in your life, ready for application, and has been applied in your life before. Oida. The one who knows, that's doctrine in his heart as a belief system, the right thing to do, divine viewpoint, will of the Lord, and does not do it. Now, here's where the rubber hits the pavement, dear heart. What's he say? It is sin. When you, know the, do, when you know the right thing to do and do it not, when it's oida, you go like, Pfft. when it's clear as a bell, this is the Lord, what the Lord wills. And you don't do it. See, you want to stay out of that. Because whatever, whatever reasoning you have to go ahead and commit the sin, knowing it's sin, Whatever bargaining chip the devil has given you in verse 13 and 14, whatever crazy plan, scheme he has, bankrupts your soul. Don't go there. Oh, please, people, do not go there. You're not going to get what you think you're going to get because what you're doing is sin. Nothing good for you is going to come from that. See, that's what he's trying to say. Point number one, the doctrinal point that James is making in our lesson text, at least to me, is live your tomorrows today. Live every day is today. Don't live it in anticipation of something else. Live, just live it one day at a time. Live it to the fullest with God. And tomorrow get up and enjoy the day with him. I'll tell you, every day with Jesus, what it is for me is vacation. It is. Every day with Jesus is like, you know, every day with Jesus, sweeter day before. I'll tell you, every day, I'm serious about this when I say that. In my heart, my, my soul, it's like vacation. Every day I get up, I am excited to be in his presence. I'm excited to see what he's going to do that day uh, on, on, uh, with me. And... It's, it's like vacation to me. I just, my soul just gets all fired up. It gets in a rest mode uh, with him. And it's just, it's just like going on vacation for me. Uh, for me. Well, anyhow. Uh, Jesus taught the doctrinal principle. Listen, James, and J James now, he taught it in James 4, but Jesus taught it. Listen, in Matthew, the 6th chapter, verse 34. That's the last verse in this long series that he taught on don't worry which began in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, verse 25, which is a great lesson that Christ taught. I mean, I mean, you expect him to be, you know, be top of the charts on this deal. But what he taught in that about the birds and the bees <laughs> is magnificent in there about life. So in Matthew 6, 34, uh, how, how he closes that sermon out is he said, so don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself. <laughs> don't worry about tomorrow. And he goes through a whole thing about your life. Uh, he goes through a whole series of different aspects of your life from verse 25 with the theme, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Remember that t-shirt? Don't worry, be happy. I love that t-shirt. Don't worry, be happy. He said, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. <laughs> I love that. See, I'm in that mode right now with this church. See, I'm wanting to go to Moody, and here we are in Roebuck. Okay. So that's tomorrow. And right, today, so be content where you are today. And I went, okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, I'll take care of itself. So what should I do? What should I worry about? <laughs> nothing. Yeah, nothing. Each day 
has enough trouble of its own. And that word trouble is in the Greek is K-A-K-I-A. Kakaya is the word for evil or bad. There's going to be a lot of stuff in, listen, each day has enough trouble of its own. See, let me, let me get you to go somewhere with me. Go back up a little bit to Ephesians. The fifth chapter, you're familiar with this verse. We quoted around here quite a bit. He says in verse 13, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. That's the light of divine truth. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, and he quotes, Awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now watch verse 15. Ephesians 5, 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Don't walk in your sleep. Don't walk as a dead person. Don't walk in your sleep. Worst thing to do is walk in your sleep. That's verse 13, 14, walk in your sleep. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Watch this, making the most of your time. You see, the thing about the day is the time. See, the day is broken down into time, isn't it? That's how you count your day, not the days of the week, but that's how you count your day in time. What time is it? It's 3 o'clock. What time is it? It's 7 o'clock. What time is it? 12 o'clock. What time are we going to eat? What time is it? What day is it? What time is it? Do I have time? No. Okay. Do I have time? Yes. Hurry up, but you got time. Therefore, be careful how you walk, making the most of, making the most of. How do you do that? The Lord's will. Always conscious of his will in my life. Always conscious of it. How did my morning go? I don't know. I, who to go with? <laughs> who went with the Lord? It's good morning. Didn't get all that you wanted to accomplish. We got everything. You got, listen, you, you, you made the most of it. Listen, you, if you can make the most of your time, you're ahead of the game. If you made the most of it, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. See, there it is again. See that? Not just your day, but your time in the day is to be walked with the Lord. So, all your tomorrows are lived in all your todays. Do you understand that? As spiritual advancing believers, we are instructed to live one day at a time. Matthew 6, 11, we pray for our daily what? Bread. Not our weekly bread, our daily bread. Our daily bread. Each day of each week has been specially created to be lived according to the Lord's will. Listen, you didn't come up with the week. You didn't create any day. You didn't create any time of any day. But you do get the privilege of living it. What a privilege that is. God did all the hard work. All you got to do is live it. You go like, oh, living is so tough. Oh, you should have tried creating it. <laughs> I mean, there's the big job, right? Listen to Romans 14, 6. I love this Roman passage, 14, 6. He who observes the day, observes it for the Lord and gives thanks to the Lord. You observe the day. You observe it's Tuesday, but what about the time invested in Tuesday? Well, how did you invest your time on Tuesday with the Lord? Listen to, listen to verse 7 and 8. For not one of us lives for himself. See, that's the problem with verse 13 and 14. You got somebody living for themselves and not for the Lord. And not only does, does not one of us live for himself, not one of them, one of us dies for himself. 
For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. That's what ought to motivate you. And I love this in verse 9. Listen how, how he sums this up. For to this end, whether we, whether we live or we die, we're with the Lord. For to this end, watch this now, Christ died and lived again. And we call that death, burial, and resurrection. That he might be, listen, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. That's his desire. He went to the cross so that he could be the raised from the dead so he could be the Lord, the living, dynamic Lord of your life. Think about that. This whole crucifixion, this whole gospel deal was so that he could be the Lord of your life as it's being lived. That's a phenomenal idea. I love that passage. Point two, every day and its time and events are a gift from God. Now watch that. Every day, all of its time and events are gifts from God. When he completed the sixth day of creation in Genesis 131, he said, God saw all that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. That's how he divides his time. He divides it by morning and evening. You have as much responsibility in both of those categories as you do in any single one of them. You live for the Lord in the morning and you live for the Lord in the evening. Some people aren't willing to do that. Some people are willing to live for the Lord in the morning and not in the evening by the choices they make, and other people are willing to live by the Lord in the evening and not in the morning because they don't like where they're going and what they're doing. And I'm telling you that the way that God set the day up is morning and evening, and it's all good, and it's all about the Lord. Ecclesiastes. Oh, listen, I'm going to give you homework, and you ought to do this because this is phenomenal. Everybody knows this passage and nobody studies it. Everybody knows Ephesians, the third chapter, the first eight verse, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. When I say this, you'll know this. There is an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event under heaven. Agreed? Now look, then he goes through this eight verses. There's a time for this and a time for that, right? But here's what you don't do. You don't pay any attention to that. You don't pay any attention to it. Listen what he did. I want you to go back and I want you to study it. Not tonight, but I want you to go back and I want you to study this. He put it in seven sets. Now, when he does that, this is a big deal. He put it in seven sets. I wrote this on your paper. He put it, Solomon. Why is there any man here tonight? Include me. Solomon gave seven sets of four times equal 28, and he contrasted them. This is one of the most phenomenal studies you could ever make in your life about time because days divided into time were timesharers in the true sense of the word. And when you go back, I want you to go back and stop, gla stop glancing through these scriptures and start reading them. When you find time used that many times, it's a big deal. It's used, 29, it's used 28 times. Seven sets of four times is 28. Now, you know me and my math, so you want to check it all out. But I think you'll find, and listen, there, there's time to be born and time to, right? Right? They're all done this way. And you need to pay attention to that. Seven sets, the word seven in Hebrew is a big deal. Seven sets, four, four times, 28 times he does this. 
He puts them in sets. And it's well worth your study because it talks about your life broken down into time of, and events. Time and events. Jesus in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 25 and 34, along with James 4, 13 through 17, makes the same doctrinal point regarding living every day as an opportunity for God's will to be activated. Jesus emphasized the word worry about stuff and our Heavenly Father's attitude towards our lives. You watch that comparison. He's going to do it again in there. He's going to do it too in that Matthew 6. Well worth your study now to watch. Let the Word speak to your heart. Don't speak to the Word. Don't read it casual. Read it and let the Spirit of God speak to your heart about these issues, especially when you're in a study. And I give you these verses. I want you to go back and I want you to, I want you to let the Holy Spirit teach you bring reality out of the scriptures of your life and pay attention. They're just full of just great information if you just take time to let the Lord teach you. Okay? For example, when it comes to the word worry, you'll see that used a lot in this Matthew 6. But pay attention in there. Pay attention. Every time he's talking about this thing, worry, pay attention in there about your heavenly Father's attitude towards your lives. For example, pay attention to verse 26, 30, 32, and 33. Because you want God to be actively engaged in your life. And, you, and you're accumulating all this stuff, and you're worried about so many things that you should not be worried about because they're just ornaments on the tree of life. They're just ornaments on the tree of life. And so pay attention to your heavenly father is the point of this whole thing. So pay attention to that when you read, when you go back and you read this, when you go back and read Ecclesiastes and when you go back and read Matthew 6, go back and pay attention. Spend a little time with the Lord in this. He wrote that for you to just grasp it and let it. Just sit in it and let it, you know, it's like a hot bath to me. You know, sometimes you just got to have a good hot bath, a soaker, I call it. I want no calls. Don't bother me. I'm, I've got to do a soaker. And that's the way you need to study these scriptures sometimes. You need to sit down and just do a soaker on them. And I've given you a couple that are really dynamite. I think you'll really enjoy them. You're, you're, you're mature in the word enough to really sit down on some of these passages and really enjoy them. And so I want to give you a heads up on them. The third thing in closing, I want to say, sometimes we get so caught up in the now living that we forget that God has all of our future living planned as well as our now living. I mean, the things that you're ambitious to have in your life God has more desire for it in you than you could ever desire for it in yourself the truth is you're not managing your now well enough for him to give it to you or or you're not well enough prepared to have it you need a little more seasoning in your life and your growth and your attitude and your your idea of how do I deal with stress and not having things I want and all that kind of stuff. There are things that you have, the Lord has to deal with you to get you at some kind of level playing field in order to be, listen, he wants you to have all the blessings that he could possibly bestow on you in time because it just irks the devil. We know it irks him because he wanted all of it to take, be taken away from Job and the father allowed it to go on because he knew he had a Job who didn't care. And in the end, what did God do? He, he gave it all back to him, multiplied. Because God's heart is that heart of the desire for that. And all of that taken away and giving back was due to the angelic conflict 
It had nothing to do with Job. It wasn't about Job and his relationship with God. It was God's relationship with the devil and the warfare that goes on that Job was caught in and willfully caught in, honorably caught in. And, and listen, honorably walked it out. And that's what God loves. He don't want to take stuff away from you. He doesn't do that. He doesn't want to have in your life. I mean, people get mad at God because he, he gives something. Oh, it's all about, oh, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love this. And then God takes it away, and they go like, I hate you, God. Let me tell you, that, that attitude was already there before he gave you the gift. And yet, out of his marvelous grace, he gave you a gift. And you thanked him for it. And then cursed him when he took it back. You get attached to it. It's just a detail. You can't, listen, even if it's your own child, you can't take it, you can't take them when you leave. You can't take them with you. You can't take a child with you. The Lord can't, but you can't. The pharaohs in Egypt used to think they could. You can prepare him to make his own journey. That would be good, wouldn't it? Can't take you. Can't take your car. You can't take your job. You can't take your health. There's nothing you can take out of this world other than the word of God in your soul. Can't take nothing. And what, what makes you think that you're better, that you're better to take care of something than God is? What makes you think that you're better? I mean, these are, t these are tough things to go through. I mean, Job lost all of his children, lost all of his possessions, lost his health. The devil was absolutely convinced that Job was the kind of a guy, he could lose his children and be all right, he could lose his possession and be all right. But let me get after his flesh. I'll skin him alive and, and he will curse the day he ever knew God. And listen, God let him go through the ringer and he didn't. Then he restored him completely. Why? The angelic conflict's the answer. You really have to understand this stuff. You really have to understand it. Th this warfare came out of eternity into time, the angelic conflict. I, don't, I know you don't understand it. I, I don't know what to tell you except study. James shows this idea of sometimes we get, get caught up in the now living and God ha already has our future living planned. James shows this by the use of the Greek tense, future, future tense, <laughs> right? A future tense shows that, doesn't it? So you always pay attention when God is engaged in a, in a pretty heavy discussion with people about their life. No, we don't like anybody to screw around with our life, right? So we get pretty antsy about that. And that's why people, they really fuss with me about this. I have to do it. I have to do it because... I'm taught to teach the, the Word of God. The Word of God messes with your life. He goes like, look, you got to stop doing that. You can start doing this. Man, it's not personal to me. I just, I'm an ambassador. I have to carry it out. But when it comes to the future tense, you ought to pay attention to future tenses. For example, in, the, in, in verse 14, he used the future tense four times about what people what people say and do that they shouldn't. We will go, future active indicative. We will continue, future middle indicative. We will trade, future middle indicative. We will profit, future middle indicative. And he said, man, you shouldn't be doing that. What, you shouldn't be doing those behaviors? No, you're planning. All you're planning, we're going to do that. This is what we're going to do next year. Okay, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. But what are you going to do when they don't come to pass that way? 
You got all your money, all your hopes, all your ambitions, all your expectations rolled up into something that you don't have any control of. It's called the word tomorrow. In fact, tomorrow, buddy, you may not even be here. Your life is a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. And a week from now, nobody will say, who, who was that person? That's how fast people forget you, unless you have pivot status. I taught that last night. In verse 15, he used the future, future tense two times. When he comes to the solution, he only used it twice. And here's how he used it. We shall live, future active indicative, and we shall do, future active indicative. You know what that, what future is? It's God's plans. I'm going to live in God's plans. Listen, every time I, I run my plans, they're not good. I mean, it, listen, if you keep a journal, you'll find that out. Keep a journal and be honest in it. You can put it lock and key if you want to, but be honest in it. So when you look back, you can go like, that eh, didn't work out. <laughs> and I don't know how many times my friends told me that don't work out. Your friends come to you. Your parents come to you. Your pastor comes to you. Everybody comes to you and go like, I want to do that. You go ahead and do it anyway. Mm. And you write down, your, well, that didn't work out. No kidding. That happened to Paul even. The doctoral point is this, that all your tomorrows, the, all the time and events in them, all your tomorrows are in God's, are in God and not in you. All your tomorrows are in God and not to you. Look, it don't matter how much you plan, Rick. When you go to the Philippines, when, you're, when your boots hit that, no matter how much planning, it's all about adjusting, ain't it? I mean, you have no idea. You can have a plan, but you've got to live in the ability to adjust to the plan. You got, to, you got to have that. God is in charge of it. You got to keep adjusting your life to his plan. My plan is to go. That's good. My plan is to do this. That's good. But boy, you have, got, you, you have got to be on your feet to always adjusting your plans to the plan of God. Do what? Respond. Respond. Whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That word, kakaya, is used in Luke 16, 25, and well worth your read. Okay? Because I'm out of time. Well worth your read. A little old word stuck in there. That would be well worth your read. Well, thanks. You're a wonderful Bible class. I do not take you for granted because every once in a while the Lord sends me out to other people and I come back so thankful. So very thankful. Whether you, whether you believe what I say or don't believe, you, you have great class posture. And I appreciate that. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way to study with us by automobile and by Internet. For those on the Internet, we hope you will pull down our lesson because a lot of this is on paper. You heard me mention often, this is in that passage, read this and all that. You can go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com as you well know now, and pull this information. It's absolutely free to you as long as it's free to others you give it. We never charge you and we don't expect you to charge them. We thank you, Father, for the things you've taught us to today about tomorrow. We thank you for that. A remind us that our life is a vapor. To be remind us that whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We need to make that very clear to him in our daily living. That we're so thankful to belong to you, the Lord. 
who cares more for us than any group of human beings we'd ever collect together, who died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead so that he could become the Lord of our life in time and eternity. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. And thank you, Father, for a wonderful plan and the sacrifice of your son for us. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.